Hello, I'm Craig Blake. The message you're about to hear, if diligently applied, will absolutely change your life. So grab your Bible, notebook, and pen. Be ready to take notes, because I'm praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, thereby allowing the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. So God bless you. We'll be back at the end of the program. All right, let's take our seats. Let's take our seats. <laughs> you want to bring it? Well, I don't guess it matters. Ooh, look at that. All right, yes, I'll take it. Wait a minute. Strange. Which way? Got one. There we go. Bad. <laughs> Okay, it's gone. <laughs> All right, well, this is our newest grandson. This is Halsey and Rebecca's first child. And the Bible says that the first male child that opens a womb is to be sanctified and consecrated unto the Lord. Amen. And so we are here today during this session, this section of the service today, to dedicate this new life whose name is Joseph Daniel Todd. Amen. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Yep. And it's all done. There we go. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, something about the name, though. Every time I start calling that. I, I, I go into some kind of Irish accent. Oh, look at the, the wee little lad named Joseph Daniel. Ah, it'll be a cute little lady. <laughs> so, so we're just going to pray. Dedicate him to the Lord. There we go. <laughs> Good lungs. Good lungs. It's necessary for a preacher. <laughs> Father, we thank you. You are the giver of life. And Father, right now, in the sight of these witnesses, we dedicate Joseph Daniel to you that he may be brought up knowing you, that he will know life and health and strength, prosperity all the days of his life, that he'll walk in the blessings <laughs> that you have provided, that he will know your son as his Lord and Savior early and that he will walk in your paths all the days of his life. We bless him, and we bless the mother and father. And now we give them a charge to raise him. All right, you're upstage. Now. Hang on. There, there we go. 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 There's a trick to it. Yeah. It's those lights. There we go. That's better. No, nope, that wasn't it. <laughs> but we give this, these parents a charge to raise him, train him, to always be an example of our own Father God, of how to love and to live a godly life. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> All righty, there we go. Give me a minute, boy. There we go. All right. All right. There we go. Amen. Bless y'all. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Well, where are we at? Let me see here. Put everything up. Now, I wanted, yes, I'm going to give you this very quickly. There we go. We have, last week we started uh, telling you some testimonies. And we've got some more. Matter of fact, we got some that you handed in. Some that you handed in. We handed these papers out last week and the week before. How many of y'all filled some of these out? 
Okay, how many of you turned them in? See, you can't just fill them out. Got to turn them in. <laughs> okay. So, if how many of you need one of these papers to fill out to turn in? Let me see your hands. Anybody? Get them up. There you go. Okay. Let's uh, get copies of these. We will have these on the table at the back as you leave. You can pick one up. Please fill them out and get them to us. Right. Uh, I'll give you a couple real quick. Now we're calling this God's Witnesses to Divine Healing. This is number two. The first one here is from Brazil, and it was a healing from fibromyalgia. It says, Brother Curry, last week when you gave a testimony of a woman healed of fibromyalgia, I asked the Lord, why not me, Lord? I've had fibromyalgia for only four years, that woman for 14 years. The Lord said, why not you? Amen. Why not now? I said, yes, now. He said, now it's done. Amen. And all pain left. God bless you. Maria from Brazil. Number two, San Antonio. Brother Curry, you prayed for me this afternoon. This was Friday about my granddaughter. The doctor scheduled her for surgery at 8, at 8 a.m. tomorrow. That was already set. Said that fluid was around the lungs and that fluid was mucousy. So they will have to scrape it but cannot remove fluid from the inside of the lungs. So they're actually going to have to go in, scrape the lungs from the outside, get the mucus off because of pneumonia. And they said, um, but they cannot remove the fluid from the, from the lungs. They will have to put her on a ventilator with the risk of the lung collapsing. Also wants to put the IV in her carotid artery, which could have complications and she could get worse. Then they wrote and said, we cancel all the negative reports. Your prayers are greatly appreciated. We expect a miracle. Thank you. We'll update. Now, this was Friday afternoon. I got a hold of them, called, we prayed. When I was re uh, reading the text, this came in a text on my phone. This is almost exactly what we went through with our daughter Erica and then later with Crystal, almost identical. And so when I was reading this, I thought, yeah, I've been there. I've been there before. And so we called her, prayed with her. And then Saturday at 7.16 a.m., remember she was going in for surgery at 8. 7.16 a.m., Brother Curry, they just took x-rays before taking her to surgery. She is healed. Amen. 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 Then number three is from the Ukraine, and it was a blood disease. And it came in through an email, so I'll just read it the way it was written. Dear Brother Kuri, my cousin visited your church in the last year. It's, it's the way it's written. <clears throat> He requested cloth, you pray. We have put on my son every day for one month. His blood is clean. Doctor said cannot be truth, must be mistake. <laughs> God bless you. Please come Ukraine. Slava Bogu. <laughs> Amen. And this was from Natalia Treblinska. Something like that. But uh, so we are coming to the Ukraine. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> now, number four, Australia. This is uh, just, i just put a title on this, it just says, Truth Sets Free. Brother Blake, Christian greetings to you and yours. I recently listened to your online Divine Healing Technician training seminar. Thank you so much for putting such pure truth on the internet. I've never heard so much truth packed into such a short time. <laughs> Must not have heard all of it, because I'm, <laughs> nobody's ever said I preach for a short time. <laughs> I had already quit going to church, but I promised my wife that I would stay close to God. One Sunday while she was at church, I began looking up truth and healing online. Your site came up. I thought to myself, what's this yank got to say? <laughs> Gotta love the Aussies. Amen. <clears throat> Three hours later, when my wife returned from church, I was already on my third session and couldn't turn it off. I made her sit and listen to two more sessions with me. Now I've begun doing what you teach, and it works. I will never doubt God's word again. I've gathered friends, as you suggest, and will be contacting your Aussie rep to start a life team. Blessings, mate. Glory and freedom. Robert Guzman. Amen. Amen. So we're collecting all of these. We're putting all these out. We'll have one each week, and we're just kind of choosing some of the different ones. Um, and some I'm waiting to verify. Uh, before I make statements because they're rather dramatic and so we, as we verify them then we'll start bringing those out But we try to verify everything first, but this is number two. We have number one 
If y'all like, we can start printing these and putting them out there so you can pick them up. But eventually, we plan to have all of these in a kind of a little booklet-like thing. So just a list of testimonies that would be good to give somebody that they could just read if they're going through something. Then the testimonies will help build their faith in those areas. So, next. Yes, we are going to receive our morning offering. Yes, we are. So, morning offering. Now, if you're going to make out checks, please make it to Dominion Life Church or D-L-I-A-C, either one. And this is tithes and offerings, so you can tithe or offer, okay, either way. Now, I want to read something to you uh, very quickly here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you can go ahead and you can be working and writing your check or whatever you need to do. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Am I not an apostle? This is the Apostle Paul writing. Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not you my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are you in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? <clears throat> or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working? Who goes to warfare any time of his own payment, his own charge, his own fee? He plants, who plants a vineyard and eats not of the fruit thereof? Or who feeds a flock and eats not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Strange that he would use the law of Moses. Isn't it right? Remember, everybody's law's gone, no law, nothing at all. But here he actually uses the law of Moses to prove his point. Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treads out the corn. Does, not, does God take care for oxen? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that plows should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have... Now, here's the point I want to get to. Nevertheless, we have not used this power or authority, but we suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar? Even so has God ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel... I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, I said all that to say this. Number one, it is right and it's okay and we have every right, per se, to receive of the finances that come in uh, to live off of. Amen? What, what he just said. Now, Paul also said, though, even though he has that right, he has forbear that right and he doesn't do it so that he doesn't have to charge for the gospel and he doesn't hinder the gospel. Amen? Now, the reason I said that is because the finances of this church, the tithes, the author offerings, and everything, and from church members here and around the world that do send in their tithes and offerings here, it does not pay for any salary, any rent, any utilities, none of that. I don't get any money from this. Nobody here gets any money from this. Every dime that comes in through these Sunday morning services and as tithes and offerings, every bit of it goes to missions, missionaries, the Feeding Jesus Outreach, Benevolent ministries to help those in need. Uh, J matter of fact, JGLM, not the church even, but JGLM pays the rent, the utilities, everything. And we also pay 
uh, we get letters from people needing help. Can't pay their rent, can't pay the utilities, and we have paid a lot of people's rent and utilities, again, not from the church, but from JGLM and from our partners with JGLM. And so all I'm saying is that here the Apostle Paul makes the point that if we wanted to live of it, we could, but we, the reason we don't, and we can say along with the Apostle Paul, we do not live off of the money that comes into this church. Amen? Amen. And the reason we don't is because I want to help people and we don't want to hinder the gospel and we want to use all of that to go to help missionaries and we are supporting missionaries and orphanages and Bible schools around the world and it is through your help that we do that. Amen? Amen. So, so I just want you to know that what you're giving goes to help people. It doesn't go toward anybody's lifestyle or you know anything else no salaries or anything else it all goes back out to the people so and we thank god that we are able to do that that god has blessed us as a ministry as jglm with partners that can help that and so we just want to thank god for it so father i thank you for the finances that you do bring into this fellowship and that you are able to bless people outside this fellowship and within the fellowship father from the finances that you bring through your people and Father, I thank you right now that your blessings are upon them and that they are blessed with every spiritual blessing and that all of the blessings, even those of Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, all of those overtake them and flood them. And Father, I thank you for creativity and for, for businesses that, that you're giving them ideas to start and things that can help you and help advance the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom. So in Jesus' name, I bless these people and we release prosperity to them, spirit, soul, and body, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, let's go ahead and pass through, and he's going to take us in worship, and we will be back shortly. Here, a quick um, let you know about the Israel trip. I do have the numbers, right? Uh, it, they need a $150 deposit ASAP, if you decide you want to go. And then the total trip from New York will be 3575 then we would have to make arrangements from here to there which we can do also as a group or we can all just meet there but it would be 3575 round trip all included everything's included <laughs> and then 150 deposit so that gives you some basic numbers to work with so if you're interested get in touch with us quickly we want to put this thing together and make it a good trip for everybody so we release the children. Go, be trained. Become soldiers of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, well, this morning, <clears throat> we have some handouts we're going to give you with the scriptures that we'll be going over. But I want to... Something's been going on the way God has been doing this, because I didn't do this on purpose by any stretch. But <clears throat> every week... One message, it's almost like a to be continued because it just continues on. And it seems like each week around the last scripture that I mentioned to you is the title of the next week's scripture or next week's sermon or message. And they just, they're building. I don't know if you can see that or not. We'll have all these avail available for you. We will have them, a list of them. So if you missed one, you want to get one, you can do that. But if you remember when we first started, first week of this year, we started with God keeps his promises. And then the second week, we found out that we are to have faith in God, and we can have faith in God because God keeps his promises. Amen? Very simple. And then we went through the scriptures last week, and one of the last scriptures, or one of the main scriptures that we talked about, was 2 Corinthians 4.13, about having the spirit of faith. So, today we're going to minister along the lines of not just having the spirit of faith, but manifesting the spirit of faith. Manifesting the spirit of faith. And 2 Corinthians, we're going to start 2 Corinthians 4.13. Now, do we have those handouts? We can pass those out. Let's pass. If you want one, raise your hand. If you want a handout with the scriptures, there you go. So, basically, everybody. So, we will pass those out to you. In the meantime, you can look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, where it says, We, having the same spirit of faith, notice, same spirit of faith, 
according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. Now, there's a lot you can get out of this one verse. Now, you go back and read the whole thing, of course, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But the key here is this. Number one, same spirit of faith. We all have the same spirit of faith. You got that? It's the same spirit of faith. Then he says, according as it is written. In other words, it was written down. And this one, I want you to notice this about Paul. <clears throat> he said, it's written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. And he said, we also, since we have the same spirit of faith as the people that was written in the Bible, we believe and we also speak. So what is Paul saying? What you see in a person in the Bible, what's in them is in you. Do you get that? Yes. <clears throat> and if it's in them and it's in you, then you can do what they did. Amen? Not just you can, but you should. Okay? Because if they got the spirit of faith and you've got the spirit of faith, then you ought to be manifesting the spirit of faith the same way they did. Now, maybe not exactly the same thing, but in the, along the same manner. And you ought to be able to manifest the spirit of faith. Now, we're going to add to that in just a moment. But I want you to see this. Hebrews 11.6. Let's just lay some groundwork. Hebrews 11.6. Everybody knows it. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. You hear that? So if you don't have faith, you can't please him. You cannot please God without faith. Is that right? That's what he said, right? Okay. <clears throat> For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that is, that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So there's two things <clears throat> involved in faith. Number one, you've got to believe that God is. And number two, you have to believe that he rewards those who seek him, that go after him, and believe that he is. Right? See, I, I, I'm going to make a statement right in the middle of this and in your scriptures, but people ask me, oh, you believe in divine healing. No, I don't believe in divine healing. I don't have faith for healing. Right? I believe in God, who is the healer. Yeah. You see the difference? I don't believe in a God who is a healer. People say, well, I believe in a God who is a healer. I believe in a healing God. I, I don't say it that way. Why? Because it says, he is the Lord that healeth thee. Right? I don't believe in, in any other ways, gods, or anything else. My God has made his name Jehovah Rapha. That's his name. He is the God that healeth thee. Healeth in the present tense, always in the present tense. So the God that heals you is always a present tense God. You got that? Amen. It wasn't passed away. It wasn't future. He's not the God that's going to heal you. He's not the God that did heal you. He is the God that healeth thee, present every day, right now, and I can walk in that life and health every second. And when I walk in healing every second, guess what? That's called divine health. Amen? That's better than getting sick and getting well and getting sick and getting well. Now, so I, I and people say, well, you believe in that faith healing stuff. Nope. <laughs> Listen, I don't have faith for healing or in healing. I have faith in God who is the healer. My faith is in God. You got that? It's not in healing. Because if my faith was in healing, if I ever didn't see somebody healed, then my faith would falter. But my faith is in God, who is the healer. And because of that, my faith in healing, in that sense, would never falter. You get that? Because he is the God that healeth thee. Now, in Romans chapter four, uh, 14, yeah, 14, 23, just giving you some basic scriptures. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eats not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Is that what it says? Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. When was this written? It's written from Paul to the Romans. Was that after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ? So apparently Paul believes that sin still exists after Jesus was resurrected. Right? Contrary to common, popular, modern theology that says there is no sin now, right? <clears throat> he says whatever is not of faith is sin. So, now let me, let me ask you this. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 4.13. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Now notice what, what's written here. Having the same spirit of faith. Look at the word written, believed, 
spoken, believe, speak. You hear that? Believed, spoken, believe, speak. Right? Notice what is connected with believing. Speaking. Every time somebody mentions believing, speaking is mentioned with it. If you have the spirit of faith, the number one manifestation of the spirit of faith is speaking. You get that? You can't get around that. That's just the way it is. The, the only manifestation of the spirit of faith mentioned in the section talking about the spirit of faith is speaking. And he says, because I believe, I speak. So if you believe, you will speak. Now, let's just prove that. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Jesus, you remember the story here? Jesus has just come down off the Mount of Transfiguration, which I would love to to preach on. God has been this last week just stuff even as late as last night. It was hard to go to sleep just because of some things that's going on in me and in the spirit and it's um, you know whether you believe whether you don't believe I'm telling you stick around hide and watch what's fixing to happen. Amen? Some things are fixing to happen. All right, That's the best way I can say it. Um, could you go back into that Mount of Transfiguration and look and Moses and Elijah appeared to them and they had a vision of him and they were talking with Jesus and they were right there. And yet Jesus didn't, they, they said, well, let's build, you know, three different tabernacles right here. And he said, no, don't, don't, don't worry about that. Isn't that right? He said, that's not what we're here for. I'm telling you, some things in the spirit is amazingly about to happen. Okay. I'll talk to you more about it a little bit later on maybe. But here, notice what he says. They, they had just come down off the Mount of Transfiguration. They come upon their disciples. Their disciples are arguing amongst themselves, but they're also talking about what's going on. And this man had brought his son to the disciples, and their, the disciples could not set the man free, set the boy free. <clears throat> so then, after it's all said and done, Jesus says, bring the boy to me, and he does, and he sets him free, proving that it was God's will, even though the disciples couldn't get it done. So some would say, well, it must not have been God's will if that's what happened in church. Well, they prayed and it didn't happen. It must not be God's will. No, the actions or the results of a disciple do not always exemplify the actions or the will of God. Sometimes the disciples don't fulfill the will of God. We know that because immediately afterwards, Jesus set the boy free. So we know it was God's will to set the boy free. Right. Amen? And their failure wasn't God's will. Matter of fact, we know that because they came and said, why couldn't we do it? And Jesus said unto them, verse 20, because of your unbelief. End of story. Isn't that simple? Why couldn't we do it? Because of your unbelief. Now, he says, for verily, now watch this, verily I say, isn't that a form of the word speak? Okay. Verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say, doesn't say that. It says you shall. Okay? You shall say. And what, what do you say? If you have faith, you shall say. Isn't that what he's saying right there? If you believe, you will speak. Why? Because that is how you manifest the spirit of faith. If you have faith, as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. Now let's look at that second part there. You're going to talk to the mountain. You're going to speak to it, and the mountain's going to obey you. You're going to command it. Notice he didn't say, mountain, please move. He didn't say, Father, please move the mountain. Is that right? He spoke to the mountain and said, remove, now watch this, remove hence to yonder place. Now, I don't, I was raised saying yonder. All right? If you go back, I'm telling you, most of the people in the South, their vocabulary comes from the Bible. <laughs> Yonder, fixing, tote. You ever heard of the tote? You know, tote this. People say, tote it. We didn't carry it. No, you tote it. You tote it from here to there. You know, that's it, right? <clears throat> See, and, and you have to look at it because you also find it. You go back into the Old Testament, you'll find the, um, the Southern prophets in the Old Testament talk different than the Northern prophets. In my opinion, they were better prophets. Anyway, let's just go out right on. He says, remove, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. You get that? You, you, if you have faith. Now, notice he didn't say, matter of fact, 
he says there, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. So Jesus never really talked about volume or amount of faith, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But if he did, the amount of faith that will move a mountain is the size of a grain of mustard seed. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Part B there, that sentence, there's a part in there that says he'll do wickedly and these kind of things. And then it changes. It says, but the people, actually, we'll just read it. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Now, there's not really a way to get around that. If you know God, you will be strong, and you will do exploits. Now, really what it comes down to is what do you consider an exploit? Romans chapter 12. I'm just giving you some scripture, laying these things, laying the foundation here. Romans chapter 12, verse, starting in verse 1. Paul, again, writing to the Romans, says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Now, beseech, that's a strong word. In other words, I'm, I'm, I'm urging you, I'm, I'm really trying to draw this out of you. He said, with everything that's in me, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now notice, he said you. He didn't say God's going to make you present your body. He said you present your body. So who's presenting the, your body? You present your body as what? A living sacrifice, right? You present your body a living sacrifice. Why would you present your body? A, see, in, in the church, many times we talk about the body as especially uh, people that, that don't believe in healing. They look at the body, well, healing, that's just on the far bottom spectrum of things. You know, the important thing is the spirit. Well, absolutely, the spirit is important because that's the real you anyway. And the, the flesh is your earthly tent, is the way Paul said it. So there is that, that thing. However, how many of you know your body is pretty important because as soon as your body stops to function, you don't stick around, <laughs> right? So it's kind of important that your body be fixed whenever it's broken. Yes. Amen? Amen? Now, matter of fact, he said that our body, our bodies, our physical flesh body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen? So our bodies being temples of the Holy Ghost, notice what he says, we are to present our bodies, a living sacrifice, holy. Our bodies are to be holy. You got that? He said your body, you should present your body, a living sacrifice, holy unto God. So you need to, you need to realize that your body is holy and you, you need to treat it as such, right? So your body, which is the temple of the Holy Ghost, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, this world's system, the world's way of doing things, but be transformed, and that word transformed there is the same word used by Jesus or about Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, better more from my he. <laughs> but it means, and, and it literally means to be changed from the inside out. He's saying don't let the world squeeze you into a shape where you act, talk, look like it, do all that. But instead, he said, rather be transformed from the inside out and let what's in you be seen on the outside. And he said, now, the way it's seen on the outside is that you let, before it can be seen on the outside, before the Spirit of God can truly live on the outside of you, you have to present your bodies a holy living sacrifice. Why? Because for him to live through your body, your body has to be dedicated to him. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, how are you transformed? How is your body transformed? How is your life transformed? By the renewing of your mind. Renew it to what? To what the Word of God says, which the Word of God agrees with the new you that's born again in your spirit. And whenever your mind agrees with your spirit, then your body, and you've already presented your body a living sacrifice, now everything starts to line up and people start to see the Spirit of God working through you in every aspect of your life. Now, he says to have your be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, now watch what he says in verse 3, for I say, there he is saying again, through the grace given unto me to 
every man. Say every man. Every man. And you know that means women too. Right? Every man and woman. To every person. Right? You got that? To every person, every man that is among you. So now what he's saying, he's saying to everybody, it wasn't to just a few. Amen? Amen. To whosoever. To every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, what he's saying is, he's got pe you got people there in Rome that Paul was writing to, and he says, listen, some of you guys, you're doing some faith exploits. Some things are happening. Things are going on, and Romans is probably the most theological book. These people were thinkers. They were going into this stuff. They were sorting this stuff out, so to speak. And he said, listen, you got guys there that are saying, man, I got all this faith, and, I, and you ain't got no faith. Well, the group I used to be with and was in the middle of, that's exactly the way it was. You know? Oh, well, I'm not feeling well. What's the matter with you? Ain't you got no faith? Where's your faith? Why don't you get... And they were looked down upon if they got sick. They, and then people, because of that, people started hiding when they got sick, couldn't talk about it, couldn't ask for help because that showed a lack of faith. And it got to be this thing where it was very demeaning. And pretty soon, people didn't come to church when they were sick because they didn't want anybody to know they didn't have faith. That's the way they thought of it. And so they just stayed home and suffered instead of actually finding out what needed to be done and to live in life and health and coming to church and getting ministered to. Of course, it wouldn't have mattered back then if they came to church because they would have said, well, if you have faith, you'll get healed. Well, you know, that, that's, even if they said, here, I'll pray for you, but if you don't have faith, you ain't going to get anything. Well, then why come to church? Because if I had faith, I'd have been healed. You see what I'm saying? It, it, that was the, the process, the mental process. And that's what made it so wrong was that it put people under condemnation rather than lifted them to get them to walk in the truth and to get help when they needed it. And anything that keeps you from getting help when you need it, that's not of God. God wants you to get help. Amen? He wants you to get help first from the body of Christ. It, well, first from his own spirit in you. That would be the best. But if you're not able to do that for whatever reason, then get help from the body of Christ. And then if you can't get help from the body of Christ, if you need to go outside that, then so be it to live. And, well, you know, I'm not against doctors by any stretch or any of that kind of stuff. You understand? Get help. Get, you know, alleviate the suffering, especially when it comes to children because they can't tell you how much it hurts and that kind of stuff. So you should never make them suffer for your lack of faith. Amen? But at the same time, we should be able to, God should be our first resort, not our last resort. Amen? Amen. So, but now let's look at this. These people thought they had faith and were telling people, I got faith and you don't have faith. But he said, let every man. He said, I'm telling you. And I'm talking to everybody there that don't, that everybody, right? Don't anybody there think of themselves more high than they ought. In other words, just because your faith worked for you and their faith didn't work for them, don't, don't, you know, make a big deal of it and don't think you're better than them or more highly of yourself, right? In other words, but he says, but to think soberly, right? Think clear-minded. According as God hath dealt to every man, every person, the measure of faith. Now notice, it does not say he has given to some people a great measure of faith and to other people a small measure of faith. It doesn't say that at all. He says, God has dealt to every person the measure of faith. Amen? Amen? You look it up, it's there. It's in the Greek. The measure of faith. A particular definite article is there. It, it, and it says, he has given you the measure. So we all start with the same degree of faith. Everybody, just like we, unless there is a genetic issue, we all start with the same number of muscles. But we all know that everybody's muscles aren't the same because some people exercise them and some people don't. Right? But we all start with the same measure of faith. But your faith can increase. Or it can even decrease. You say faith can decrease? Absolutely. Right here in Matthew 17. We know that. Now watch this. I think I actually get into it here. Yep, I get into it in just a minute. But let's, let's follow along with me here. <clears throat> According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Not a measure, but the measure. Right? Say it with me. Say the measure of faith. Now say this, I don't have a measure, I have the measure of faith. All right? now say it again. I, there you go, the measure, amen. You realize you don't have a measure, you have the measure. Amen? 
So you cannot say, well, I don't have enough faith. Because you've been given the measure of faith, and the smallest measure of faith that is mentioned in the Bible is the faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. And Jesus said that the faith that size will move a mountain. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. So if you have the smallest amount of faith mentioned, you can move the biggest object in your path. Amen? Amen. You say, then why would I want to grow in faith? Why would you not want to grow in faith? First off, right? But secondly, you say, well, what can it do greater than? It's not that you can do greater things. It's that you have a deeper faith in God. You have a deeper relationship with Him in faith. You understand? Now, how big is the measure of faith? Well, we just talked about that. That it's the smallest measure given in the Bible. If you go from the size of, the, of a grain of mustard seed, the one step below that is no faith. Okay? So, how do we know? Well, we do know this. We know that we have at least that much to begin with. So what did he say about the measure of faith? Well, I just quoted to you again. Verily, I say unto you, if you have faith, that's a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Do you realize that the faith you have the minute you get born again is enough to make it so that nothing shall be impossible to you? Now, the rest of your life is removing the some things that you think are going to be impossible to you. You get that? You start with the faith. It's given to you. It's a gift of God, not of your own, lest you should boast. Amen? Amen. So it, that, that faith there, it's a gift of God. And you have that faith the minute you're born again. And so the rest of your life it's not about you trying to build up this, this huge amount of faith. It is simply that you are eliminating things that you used to think were impossible. Now you're finding out they're possible. Because okay? it's easy to stand here and say, oh, God can do anything. Yeah, well, that's not the problem. Can God do this thing? See, most people believe he can do anything. They just don't believe he can do this thing. Amen. Right? See, it's really easy to believe in general. It's just a whole lot harder to pinpoint it. You go to a large crowd and you say, there is someone here with a back problem. That's easy to say, Amen. right? But walk up to a perfect stranger in a mall and go, excuse me, but you're having a back problem on your left side, right? You're try doing that. It takes a little bit more boldness and courage. Amen? So it's pretty easy to believe God can do anything. It just takes a little bit more usually to believe he can do this thing. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, what is the greatest miracle that can ever happen? Come on. Born again. Salvation. Is that right? Is that true? Do you believe that or are you just sounding religious and sounding, you know, well, that's what everybody says, so I'll agree with that. Is it, is it the greatest miracle? Yeah. Right? Now, I'm not putting down other miracles, but I'm saying, is it the absolute, without a doubt, the greatest miracle that a person can get born again? Yeah. All right? Are y'all convinced? I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. That'd be... New birth, salvation, right? Let me ask you this. How do you get saved? By faith. All right. Now, how many of you are saved? Then you have already accomplished the greatest miracle that can ever happen. Everything else is downhill from here. You understand what I'm saying? It might be exciting to watch, okay? You know, coming across a bus wreck and there's 30 people dead and you get them all to rise from the dead, pretty neat to watch. Okay, but that still would not be the greatest miracle you've ever experienced. Amen? Amen. The greatest miracle you will ever experience is to be born again. Isn't that right? Yeah. And how did you get that? By faith, right? So you've already experienced the greatest miracle by faith. So anything else ought to just be, oh yeah, God can do that. Amen? Amen? Are you with me? Yeah. It should be easy. Listen, if we make it hard, if we make it look, oh, that's big. The only time things look, if you tell me, Something is hard. Well, I don't know if I have enough faith for that. Ah, that's awful big. Okay, that tells me you're looking at that through your eyes and not through God's. Because to God, no problem is big. Right? Now, I've argued with this because I thought God getting people to tithe might be a big thing. I'm not sure if that's how hard that is on it, but he seems sometimes to have a rough time with that. But it is an act of will. Amen? Amen. Yeah, y'all do great. I just, I've been involved in places that they didn't, but y'all do great. So. Now, notice here. There's only one name under heaven whereby men must be saved. 
Isn't that right? The name of Jesus. Faith in that name. Faith in that name got you saved. It raised the lame man in Acts chapter 3. Isn't that right? It was the name of Jesus and faith in that name that made that man stand strong there in the midst of you all, as Peter said. Right? So you've already changed. Now think about this. You have changed your eternal destiny two, by two things. You believed and you said. Isn't that right? You believe with the heart, but with confession of the lips, what do you say? You get born again. Isn't that right? You believe and you speak. Because I believe, I've spoken. And that changed your eternal destiny. Now, if that can change your eternal destiny, what do you think it can do with temporal things? What do you think it can do with your temporal body? It could fix anything. Isn't that right? I mean, if it'll do the greatest, stands to reason. If it can do the greatest, then it can do anything less. Right? Healing is, we would say, it would be less than salvation, right? In the sense that of what's the most important, spirit, soul, body, of course. But, so if, if that is true, then you've already experienced the greatest thing, so it ought to be an easy thing for you to be able to trust God who has never lied, who keeps his promises, somebody you can have faith in. It ought to be easy for you to trust him to fix your body. Amen? Amen. All right? Now, I asked one of the questions as I was looking at this. It said, you know, you've already done the most impossible thing ever. But here's the question. Can a leopard change his spots? That's what the Bible says in the Old Testament. Can a leopard change his spots? He said, yeah, but the leopard can't, technically, right? Not, that would be impossible, wouldn't it? But the fact is, according to God, according to the new birth, leopards have changed their spots. Right? Because of salvation. Nothing is impossible. You can change. Right? People say all the time, well, you know, I just can't help it this way I am. Then change. Well, you don't understand. I can't help it. Yeah, I, no, you don't understand. You can help it. Amen. Right? Because with you, with God, nothing is impossible. Amen. Amen. So don't tell me you can't. When you say you can't change, all you're telling me is you do not trust God, you don't believe God, and you don't believe what he said because he said nothing is impossible, and you're saying you found something that God can't do. Right? And that would make you bigger than God. And you're not bigger than God. Amen? Amen? Now, people say, well, yeah, but you know, uh, but, but he changed me. He recreated me. That's true. That is true. But who do you think ever does healings? People say, well, yeah, but that's God. He no. Right? Now, understand what I mean by this. People say, but, but say, okay, you can't compare a healing miracle with salvation because God changed me, made me a new person. Okay, who do you think raises the dead? Do you think it's you? Of course it's not you. You're just the vessel. You're just the, the conduit. You're just there. Isn't that right? And you believe him. But it's God that does the work. Isn't that right? There's not a person in this room that's ever healed anybody, healed a bone, healed a sickness. or None of us has ever done that. The Spirit, even Jesus himself said in John 14, 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he does the works. Isn't that right? Even Jesus didn't take credit for healing the sick. He says, the Spirit of my Father in me, he does it. So it has nothing to do with you per se, other than you believe in God. You have faith in him that is God able, is he willing, yes, then it should happen. Amen? That's how you got born again. Isn't that right? Does God want me saved? Yes. Is he able to save me? Yes. Accept, do you accept him? Yes. I accept him. I make him my Lord. Guess what? You got born again. And it's that easy to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, preach the gospel, or anything else that you think is impossible. Why? Because it's still him working in and through you. Amen? Not, not, none of us are healing the sick. Come on. It's the Spirit of God in us that does it. And if the Spirit of God in you can heal the sick, then if you get sick, He can heal you by His Spirit that's in you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. You hear that? Nothing shall be impossible to you. You've got to get that. You've got you to drill that in. Listen, there are going to be people coming here that their lives depend on you being able to believe that. Because they're going to come with things that you've never heard of. They're going to come with problems that you didn't even think existed. And they're going to come to you and they're going to look at you. And you're not going to have to say, you're not going to be able to say, excuse me, uh, I hear what you're asking for help with. 
and I don't want to say anything, so I'm going to go off and I'm going to get full of God for a bit, and I'll come back later when I can believe that he can do it. You're not going to be able to do that because they need help right then. And the minute, and if, you, if they ask you to help them and you say, ooh, yeah, that's, that's tough. That's, right then you can watch them deflate and watch them give up because, yeah, their hope should be in God, but you represent God to them. And their hope is in you. And if they don't see you full of hope and faith, then they are going to fall apart and die because they give up. Now, that's you. See, that's you. You're going to be here. People are going to come in those doors and they're going to talk to you because you come here and you're a member here or you're here regularly and you've heard this and they know that and they're watching by Internet and they're saying those people there because I brag on you all over the world. Everywhere I go, I brag on you guys. You know, God, I'm blessed because God gave me a group of people that are spiritually mature that I don't have to babysit all the time. I am blessed. And because I brag on you and because I go around the world and, and talk about you, then guess what? People are going to come and they're going, well, yeah, but you're a member of his church. You can do it. Amen? Whenever my son was in Thailand uh, during the tsunami, they went over, they, they bought their tickets six or eight months before it hit, and, but they were scheduled to go there, and then the tsunami hit, and then they were there right after, like within a matter of days. And as soon as it hit, we woke up that morning and found out that it, that it had hit. We immediately bought tickets, and my daughter and I went over. <clears throat> we were there about two weeks, ministering, setting people free, getting people born again, starting, actually starting churches in people's homes. Uh, Buddhists were getting saved because they kept saying, Why, what have we done? You know, karma, what have we done to deserve this? And we told them, you hadn't done anything to deserve this. This is the devil. God did not do this to you. The devil is trying to destroy your life, and God sent us here to help you. And we got people saved and born again and started in home fellowships right there where they were, and people got healed, blind eyes open. I mean, it was amazing things. In the midst of all of that stuff, dead bodies still in the trees, and they were still re retrieving them. A horrible, horrible situation. And we ministered to them and prayed for them and watched God heal people. And then I left. And as soon as I left, the first thing they did, they came over to my son and said, uh, where's your dad? Well, he left. Oh, well, here. They're sick. Fix them. And my, my son said, what, what do you mean? He said, you're his son. You know this. Do it. And my son said, I, I had no option. He said, I, I had to do it. You know, I was, I was there. And he, he tried to say, well, I, you know, I'm his son, but, you know, I'm not my dad. Well, but the difference was, it was the same spirit of God. Amen. And then John started ministering to him, and people started getting healed. And then John, it was funny because there were certain things happening. And John said, I caught myself saying things I'd heard you say, but this time I understood why you said them. Amen. Why? Because he stepped in that place. He didn't understand beforehand. Some things you will never learn till you do it. Some, some revelation does not come until you step out and have to have it to help somebody else. And then he saw all kinds of amazing things happen over there. I could go into many details and testimonies, and we went back over and saw more things happen. It was amazing. But I'm just telling you, the reason why is because it's the Spirit of God in people. It's not the people. It's not me, it's not John, it's not John Lake, it's not Smith Wigglesworth. It's the Spirit of God in them. God does the work. Amen? Amen. You just have to be able to have faith in Him. Right? And you can. Why? Because He keeps His promises. And He said, if you believe and lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Now you have to believe that and stand on that. And even if they don't look like they're recovering, you have to believe until they do. Amen? Because somebody's got to trust him. Somebody's got to have faith in him. Now, let's go on. Let's look at this. Say this with me. Say, nothing, nothing. is impossible to me impossible. <clears throat> because, I because I am with him and all things are possible with him. And all are possible now, do you believe that or did you just lie right here in church? <laughs> okay. Okay. He's in you. You're in him. And if nothing is impossible with him, then nothing's impossible with you. Amen? Amen? Now, it's time to do some exploits. Amen? It's time to do some exploits of faith in God. I remember, if you, if you go back to Psalm 78, you don't have to go there now, I wasn't going to bring it up or anything, but if you go back over and over again, it's talking about how God did these mighty works for Israel and how many times they forgot God, 
And he said, and in Psalm 78, he says, we will not be like them that forgot. We will tell the mighty works of God to our children and to our children's children and to even generations that are not yet born. We will tell of the mighty works of God. And then right after that, well, not right after that, but during the uh, 40s, 50s, early 60s, we had this massive voice of healing revival start. And for the first time, Healing services were being broadcast right in people's homes, live sometimes, and right from the, the place, and, and sometimes recorded and sent in. But it was on television every week. You could see Jack Coe, A. A. Allen, Oral Roberts, all these people doing these amazing things by the Spirit of God working through them. And they were showing to the generation. And it was right after that, whenever there was a great move of God, but then right after it, it was as if they forgot, and as soon as they kind of went off the television aspect of it and they forgot to tell their generation, it was, think about this, it was the generation of the 40s, 50s, going into the 60s. It was their kids that was in the 60s Amen. with the hippie movement and the, you know, all the stuff, the drugs and the experimentation and all that. Why? Why did they go into those things? Because they did not see the reality of God's power in their lives, even though they'd heard about it. They didn't see it in their families. They didn't see it in their churches. They didn't see it amongst their, their own selves. And so they started looking at other things and they started looking at Eastern philosophy, Eastern religions, and going into drugs and everything else. And we, we moved away. There was this chance for America to really hit a spiritual high level and become literally great all over again by infecting the rest of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And instead, what do we export? Drugs and you, know, you name it and everything else. So there's an aspect that we have to carry this on to the next generation. And we have to believe it, we have to move in. So it is time for God to do exploits again through us and let the people of the world see that God is in the church. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, we know that faith can fluctuate. Okay, now let's, let's prove that. If you go back to Matthew chapter 10, verses 1, and then we're going to go to 7 and 8. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. It says, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And at, Verse 7, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you've re received, freely given. And what did they do? They went out and they healed the sick, cast out devils. They did all that. Isn't that right? And they came back even rejoicing that the devils were subject to them. And Jesus said, don't rejoice over power, but that your names are written in heaven. Right? So we know that they accomplished great things. We know they had faith in God to do these things because they did them. Right? So the disciples had already been out casting out devils, healing the sick. They returned excited. We know that. But then in Matthew 17, how many of you know Matthew 17 comes after Matthew 10? Am I right? See, I, see what all you're learning here? <laughs> Matthew 17 is after Matthew 10. So after they've been out doing that, then later on they come across this one boy. They've been out healing the sick, casting out devils, cleansing lepers, raising the dead. And then they get this one boy that has what appears to be somewhat near epileptic seizures, as we would call it today. It was a, they said it was a demon. Jesus cast the thing out. And here they couldn't get that out of that boy. So obviously their faith had fluctuated because Jesus said, when they said, why couldn't we do it? He said, because you're unbelief. Well, they'd already done it before. But now they moved into unbelief. Right? So let's look at some... We, now, we don't want to be like that. We don't want to see God do things and then move into unbelief and always be talking about yesterday. Amen? Amen. Now... Let's look at some manifestations of the spirit of faith. I'm going to move through these kind of quick here. How does the spirit of faith manifest in your daily life? Okay. What would be some synonyms or descriptions of the spirit of faith? Well, expectancy. Are you expecting God to do something on a daily basis? Do you have an expectation of God to do something through you? Are you open to it? Are you looking for it? Or you just have tunnel vision in your little world and you're just busy doing your stuff? Or are you really walking with God and as you go, are you looking for God to use you? So there has to be an expectation, an anticipation, a joy. Now this is in your daily life. When you wake up in the morning, do you wake up with joy? Because I can tell you, when I get up in the morning, 
I'm ready to go. I mean, I'm excited to see what God's going to do that day. Amen. Whether through me or through somebody else, but I'm excited. I don't wake up, well, I got to go to the office. Got to go ahead and do this again. No, it's not like that at all. I'm excited. And you might say, well, yeah, but you got a cool job, man. Look what you're doing. Look what you're seeing. Look what you're hearing. Well, that's what you're supposed to be doing, exactly what I'm doing, only you got somebody else paying you. God uses your job to pay you to do his work. That's smart. Amen? You say, well, yeah, but I can't really preach because if I do, I'll get fired. Then get fired. Right? Come in here and testify. We'll let you testify that you got fired for preaching. And then somebody will hear it and go, hey, I got a job for you. It'll be better than the one you lost. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. Joy, excitement, optimism, ready to take a risk, looking for something to use your faith on, stepping out into exploits. These are how the spirit of faith manifests in a person's life. You've got to be looking. you got to be, I know many times, and you've heard me talk about this probably, but my wife told me once, we just started one thing and, I said, we need to do this. And she said, Curry, you can't do everything. I'm like, why not? You know, who says we can't? Let's move into this. It needs to be done. Let's move into it. And as soon as you get something going, you use your faith to get it going. And once it's going and you realize that you can kind of step back and it'll keep running, then it's time to find something else to put your faith on. You can't let your faith just sit around. Amen? You keep it busy. Right? That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, faith is your servant. Jesus said, which of you having a servant when he goes out in the field and he comes back in, would say, oh, here, sit down, let me cook for you. Instead, he would say, no, you got one more job to do. Cook and feed me, and after that, then you can eat. He was talking about faith. He said, your faith should be working for you. He said, it shouldn't sit and talk about the laurels of yesterday, about the time we saw the dead raised or saw the... No, it should be today. Your faith should be always be working. You always, always ought to be finding something to put your faith on. And the spirit of faith makes you want to do that. Amen? Amen. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship. Think about that. He created you. He built you. He made you. So you must have some type of potential. Amen? You're not who you think you are. You're who he says you are. We are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for what? Unto good works. You hear that? You were created for good works. You weren't created to sit around, twiddle your thumbs, and hope someday to be whisked out of here. You know, well, I'm just waiting to the end. I'm waiting to, I can step over to the other side. Man, get some things done before you step over the other side. Amen? Amen. Amen. Don't just be waiting for quitting time. Amen. You know, you ever see those employees that stand with their card in their hand just waiting for that? Watch it. Click. Yeah. Click. You know, and wait for it. Click. Boom. I'm out of here. I'm gone. Guess what? You won't last long like that around here or for the kingdom of God. Why? Because there's too much to do. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that you should walk in them. There are people out there that are your good works that are walking around sick, hurting, dying, waiting that they are your good works that God is waiting for you to get to, that he's already foreordained that you're to be the one to lay hands on them. If you won't do your job, he'll find somebody else that will. But I'm telling you, he has already ordained that you should do it. Amen? He's got testimonies out there waiting for you to come fulfill them. He's provided them for you. He, he gave you devils to, to beat up just to practice. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Listen, these, these people that we've seen healed, and, and these are trophies that you lay at Jesus' feet. These are those crowns that you're able to throw at his feet and go, you know what, all of this is for you. But we have to realize this isn't to stand up there and go, this, this is what I've done. It's to be able to say, this is what I've done for you because I love you. And I, I can't show you how much I love you except I show it onto people. And as I show people how much I love you by loving them and setting them free, they'll know your love and they'll come to you. But that's how you do that. Now, <clears throat> the cancer that I drive out of that person is an enemy that God is waiting for me to make his footstool. Do you hear that? That sickness, that disease, whatever it is, God is waiting for you to drive it out to make it his footstool. And he's waiting. It said he is seated, waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. Well, see, he's already defeated them, and he's already seated, so we know it wasn't his de defeating them at the cross that, he's, that made him his footstool. You get it? He's waiting until they be made his footstool. Who's going to make him his footstool? His body. Amen? Yeah. This is who you are. You need to realize this. He is seated. Now think about this. He, let me just read it. 
He is seated waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Just like the world is groaning, waiting for us to grow up and show up. The world is waiting for us to manifest. God is waiting for us to manifest. You know, we always talk about devils manifesting. Oh, you said devil manifesting. It's always a big deal. Well, how do you know he manifested? Because he did something that drew attention. Isn't that right? And here it says that the whole world is waiting for the sons of God to manifest. What does that mean? That we're going to show up and do something that draws some attention. And as soon as the attention comes to us, we're, what are we going to do? We're going to redirect it and go, eh, it was him. You know? Like it or don't like it, I don't care. If you like it, it was still him. If you don't like it, guess what? It's still him. Why? Because it's not me that does it, but my father in me, he does the work. So if you don't like what I do, don't talk to me about it. Talk to him about it. Right? Talk him into firing me. And I'll sit around and write books. Amen? We don't have to be near as busy. Okay? But... It's funny because it's time. We talk about demons manifesting. It's time for sons to manifest. Amen. You know, we need to be looking at these things. You know how you look at a person and a demon manifests and you can't to stop and it stops. And we need to realize this and say, you know what? I, we need to be places. We need to go places. You need to go to emergency rooms in the hospital. You need to go to malls and places where you see people. And you go, you know what? I, 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 I don't want to embarrass you, but I think I'm fixing to manifest. I, I, just feel, I just feel a manifesting coming on. Amen? I'm telling you, I'm fixed to start laying hands on the sick. I'm fixed to start casting out devils. I just, I feel, I'm, if you don't want to be embarrassed, you might want to step aside. I want to go because I just feel a manifestation coming on. I just tell it. I'm just giving you fair warning. Amen? And then just go manifest. Amen? Amen. And people say, well, what was that? I'm sorry, I've just manifested. Sorry. You know? Sorry, just got, you know, I, I was just filled with anger at that sickness, right? I was just filled, I was controlled, I was influenced by the Spirit of God and His attitude toward that cancer. So, you know, I apologize for maybe the way I did it, but I don't apologize for the fact that I did it. Amen? Now, yeah. Have you ever gone somewhere with a child? Think about this. Where's this at? You ever go somewhere with a child and... and you never know what they're going to say or do. Isn't that right? I mean, Art, Art Linkletter made a career out of children saying things that was not expected, right? And you always know that whatever they're going to say, they're going to say the wrong thing at the wrong time, right? You can raise a child wholly and teach them everything just right. And they'll go to a friend's house one time, watch a movie that has one bad word in it, and everywhere you take them from then on, at some point, that word will come out. You ever notice that? He's like, he didn't get that from me. Right? He got that from the neighbor, right? But it will always come out when it shouldn't, right? Why? Because kids don't think that way. They don't think in terms, it just comes out and they just act. You ever wonder why Jesus said, you must become as a little child? Yeah, See, our problem is we think too much. You look at a situation and instead you look at it and you go, oh, that person, man, they need help. And instead you go, but if I go and then I do this and that doesn't work and then this happens and, I, and I'll be embarrassed and then and, and, and it'll bring a disrepute on God. So, and, and you talk yourself out of it. But a little child, just while you're sitting there thinking about all that, that, if you're with a child and the child's raised right, the child will walk right on over there and lay hands on them and command them to be healed. And the whole time you're thinking, oh, well, I hope he didn't embarrass you. But he's like, no, I'm healed. Right? That's my boy. Yeah, I raised him. You know, all of a sudden now you're ready to, you know, it's amazing. When my, when my children acted up, they were my kids. When they were perfect, they were my wife's kids. You ever notice that? I don't get that. I, anyway. All right. So, listen, it's always right to do the right thing. Do you understand that? It's always right to do the right thing. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. It's time to do some exploits, right? Now, choose. You've got to make a choice to do exploits. Now, I'm going to run through these. I'm going to try to do it quickly here. <clears throat> Let's talk about some exploits and how the spirit of faith was manifested. Hebrews 11.4. You don't have to turn there. It's just all of Hebrews 11, but you're welcome to. <clears throat> Hebrews 11.4. The spirit of faith offers a more excellent sacrifice. Hebrews 11.7. The spirit of faith prepared an ark. Hebrews 11, 8. The spirit of faith obeyed and went out not knowing where he went. You notice I'm taking out the names. Why? Because we're to follow their faith 
and we're to do what they did, yes. right? So I'm taking out the names. You can put your own name in there. Because all they did was they did it by the spirit of faith. They all did it by faith. Everyone in Hebrews 11 was by faith. They chose to believe God. Yes. You can choose to believe God. So all these exploits is what you could have done had you been there and chose to believe God. The name on this thing does not matter. Why? Because it was all the spirit of God working through them. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 11, 11. The spirit of faith receives strength to conceive a child. Hebrews 11, 24 and 25. The spirit of faith refused to identify with Egypt even though it meant suffering. Hebrews eleven twenty nine. 29. The spirit of faith caused the Israelites to pass through the Red Sea as by dry land. You hear that? They had to have faith walking across that dry ground. Hebrews 11.30, the spirit of faith caused the walls of Jericho to fall down. The spirit of faith. Then look at verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of all the prophets, who through faith, and look what, here's what they did. Notice, it didn't say here through an anointing, through a gifting, through a special calling. Every one of these, it says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. How? By faith. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. By faith that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Now here's God's opinion of them, of whom the world was not worthy. Why? By faith. Faith gave them a standing, a stature, in God's eyes, where God said, you know what? The world didn't deserve them. Amen. Think about that. That's what you want to be. That's who you want to be. You want God to say, you know what? The world doesn't deserve you. Why? Because you trust in him and you do exploits. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us. Think about that. All these things, and on in the middle of it, he says God has provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, all the stuff they did, all the faith they had in God, and yet they were still waiting until this time, waiting for us. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing, now get this. This is the stuff I was going over last night. I, uh, literally, I don't know what time I finally went to sleep, but I know it was sometime around 2.30, 3 o'clock. Why? Because I couldn't sleep. This is just churning inside of me, and I'm sitting there, and we're, we're that close. Wherefore, seeing, seeing, knowing, perceiving, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Do you get that? What's these great witnesses that he's talking about? What's this cloud of witnesses? And notice first off, he didn't say they're in heaven looking down at us. He doesn't say that they look over the balcony of heaven, they see us. It says we are compassed about. Compassed about means what? They surround us. You get that? Listen, your loved ones, if they died in faith especially, they're not some distance. They are right there. They are compassed around. They, as a matter of fact, if they made it, guess what they're saying? We made it. It's worth it. Come on. Go for it. Go all out. Don't back off. Don't back down. Don't try to put it on cruise control and just coast through. If you knew what was over here, you'd be running as hard as you could because it's worth it. I've got friends there now. Men of God. Family members. Different people like that. And I'm telling you, they are right there. They're not some far off distance. And they're right there urging us on and saying, you can do this. It's worth it. 
I know what God has put in you. You can do this. And that, that, that is who is around you. Those, we are encompassed about with angels. We have a great cloud of witnesses. Actually, that word of witnesses actually means martyrs. We are encompassed about with a great cloud of martyrs, people who died for the faith even, who died as a witness. Think about that. That's what's around you. If you only get your eyes off this temporal world and quit thinking about the temporal side and realize what is eternal Amen. and how good the eternal is, the next dimension, if you want to say it that way, the spiritual realm, walking and living there, have you ever noticed, just before people actually pass away, many times it's like they're in, they're in this in-between and they talk about things that they see. And it is a, it's amazing what goes on in a person's life. I've got to hurry here. But there's a, a movie out right now called Lone Survivor. And it talks about Operation Red Wing, which was a, a four Navy SEALs went into Afghanistan and ended up getting caught there and Three of them died there, and one made it out. Marcus Luttrell made it out, and he told the story. And one of the uh, Navy SEALs that died there was named uh, Michael Murphy. And I've got the video of him. It's a documentary, and it's called Murph, uh, Murph the Protector because that was his whole attitude. I mean, you watch the whole thing. It is amazing. When he died, before he was, he was here in America with his family, and he told his family, uh, they always had this thing, because he was always sent on deployments, wouldn't talk about stuff. But he said, listen, when I leave, I don't say goodbye. I say, see you later. And the last time his mom saw him was on March 31st, I think it was. Um, and he said, when they started to leave, his mom turned to him and said, okay, well, goodbye. And he said, mom, not goodbye. See you later. She says, oh, yeah, don't pay any attention to me. That's all right. But it was the last time she ever saw him. He was supposed to go to Hawaii. Instead, he was redirected to Afghanistan. She had told him before he left, when you get to Hawaii, send us a text to let us know you made it. And so he was going to send a text to say he had made it. It was there safe and all that, made it home. Well, he goes and they're waiting and they never get the text. And they thought, so they tried to call him and could never reach him, but he'd been sent, deployed to uh, Afghanistan. He is killed on July 4th, roughly July, end of July 4th. And then they bring his body back, and they were at Dover Air Force Base to, when they brought the body, his family was there. And they watched the casket come down, and when it got to the ground, his mom said they were standing there at quite a distance, and they had the honor guard there to pick up the casket. But when they said, this is what she said she saw. It's all on this video. It's an amazing video. And she said, I saw when this casket down, it was like I saw him. It was like he got up and started walking toward us. And he was in his dress whites, and he was really bright. And he started walking toward him. And she said, and about the time that he got to me, she said it was the most strangest thing because I felt his presence and his warmth like he hugged me. She said, I felt warmth around my arms like where his arms would be. And she said he hugged her, and then he went back to the casket. I'm just telling you what she said. And then they buried him. They went to the funeral. Well, when they went to the funeral, they went through all this stuff, and they took the wreaths, and they put it on the, on the grave site, and the car was 50 foot away where they were going to ride back in, uh, his mom and his dad. And as they turned to walk back, within that 50 foot space, her phone went off and started ringing, and she thought, who is calling me? I told everybody we were going to be at a funeral. And so she pulled out her phone and looked at it, and her knees buckled, and she almost went down, and his dad said, what, what, what's wrong? And she handed the phone, and she received a text from him saying, Mom, I'm home safe. Now think about that. Now, listen, I, I have no theology, okay, to explain all that. But I know this. God is good. He loves us. He loves you. He loves every aspect. He knows what's going on. He knows it. And however he made that text come through, Two months later, three months later, it was the grace and goodness of God. Amen. And she said, from that time on, she said, I never cried after that until I started making this documentary. And they started making her relive it all. But now think about that. And the only reason I brought that up is because I want you to realize, you know, pro or con, for or against the war, and all this. Other kind of, I, okay, I'm not even talking about the politics, all right? 
I'm just saying, greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend. Right? And if you listen to his life story, it is amazing. He was a Christian, and he, he gave his life to Christ. He had confessed Christ as his Lord and Savior. And so there is all this going on. I'm just trying to tell you, when my, I could give you many other stories like this, but I know that whenever my first daughter passed away, my parents came up for the funeral, and they were staying in a hotel up in Sherman. And my mom woke up and said, Erica was standing at the foot of the bed. She could see her, clear as day, and said, and all she said was, Grandma, I'm okay, and I'm happy. Now, she was only three, two, two years, two months, and 23 days, actually, I think it was. So I can't explain that either, and I don't even like talking about it because then people get all weird with it, and you know, people say all kinds of stuff. But I'm just saying that there we are encompassed about yes, are. with a great cloud of witnesses, that, and they're not far off. They're just in the next dimension. You understand? They're just, they're just in that spirit realm. They're just right there, and they are watching. And if anything, if you could truly hear them, they would be saying, go for it. Run all out. You know when you stumble many times? It's, when you stumble when you're running is whenever you start looking around instead of keeping your eye on the finish line and being focused. And when you start slowing down and goofing off or showboating, right? It's when that goes on, that's whenever you drop the baton and you stumble and fall. It's very seldom. It, listen, the key to this, the key to walking in faith, the key to manifesting the spirit of faith is very simply this, 100%. All out. No, 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 nothing barred. I mean, all out. Go for it completely and push and run all out and don't hesitate and don't think about what people think. Don't think about what people are going to say about you. You just go all out. Amen. You get out of yourself. You forget about yourself and you just do what you're supposed to do and you don't care how it looks. Amen? Amen. So just go all out. Now, to finish Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. That word patience means consistent endurance. The race that is set before us, they've done it. It should be easier for us. Everything's easier after you see somebody else do it. Amen? Ought to be easy healing the sick. Ought to be easy raising the dead. Ought to be easy preaching the gospel. Why? Because you've seen other people do it. Right? See, that's why, that is the why of discipleship. Discipleship, you watch somebody else do it, and it makes it easier for you to do it. That's why the devil has fought discipleship so much. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, I can give you two stories. I'm not going to do it now. We'll probably save it for later. But I'll give you two names. People who manifested the spirit of faith. John Lake. I can tell you stories how he did it, but... Needless to say, 100,000 healings spoke in, 100,000 healings in Portland, spirit of faith, boldness, stepping out, causing revival in Africa that is still affecting Africa. The spirit of faith in him. One other man, spirit of faith, George Mueller. George Mueller raised, housed, fed thousands of orphans. Millions of dollars came through his hand, and he said, I will never ask a person. And the amazing thing is, let me just read this last part here to you. George Mueller did not believe he had any special gift of faith. To the contrary, he stated emphatically that the faith he operated in was the same simple faith any child of God possessed. Nothing special. He said the three reasons why he, whenever he sat down to start the orphanage, he did it for three reasons. He gave the reasons. He said, this is why we are starting orphanages, that God may be glorified. Amen. Should he be pleased to furnish me with the means in it being seen that it's not a vain thing to trust him. And thus the faith of his children will be strengthened. In other words, we're doing this so people will see that God answers prayer. We're doing this so God's children, their faith will be strengthened. You get that? It wasn't just a matter of, God, I want to hear from you and let me do this. It wasn't that at all. He said, we're doing this so that people can see that God can be trusted. Think about that. An exploit of faith. And out of that came over 10,000 orphans over a period of time. 
Millions of dollars went, never asked for a dime, took care of them. You know the stories. They would get up in the morning, no food. They'd come and say, we don't have any food for the kids. He'd say, take them in the, in the area, sit them down, put the table, put everything, set the table, get ready. We're going to pray. He would pray. Somebody would be knocking at the door. He'd say, Brother Mueller, last night I could not sleep. I know you need some bread. So I went down and I baked all this bread. It's more than I can use, but I know you need it. Here it is. Brought in the food to put the bread. They still needed other food. Started praying. And the, the, the people come down in front and the, the, the wagon that carried the other food broke an axle in front of their house and said, we can't move the thing. We can't fix it till we unload all this. And if we wait that long to reload it and take back, it'll ruin. So do you all at the orphanage by any chance need you know, 5,000 pounds of fruits and vegetables, Amen. bring it on in, right? God answered his prayers. That was, he was manifesting the spirit of faith. The same spirit of faith you've got, if I can just get that into you, for you to realize you can do exploits by the spirit of faith, having faith in God because he can be trusted because he keeps his promises. Amen? Amen. I said... But years ago now, but I'll never forget it. I made a decision. I said, I am not going to turn 70 sitting on my front porch in a rocking chair wondering what if. I would rather try and fail miserably and get on with my life and forget all this faith business if it's not real. Amen. And we stepped out and, and we took risk. And God has met us all along the way. And because of that, now we have influence on literally every continent. We're seeing so many people healed, delivered, and set free. Why? Because we manifest the spirit of faith. And I chose to do it. It is our choice to, to bring to God trophies on purpose. To say, because you are God and you deserve it. Because the people of God need their faith strengthened. Because the world needs to know there is a God. And he answers prayer. We made that decision. And we haven't stopped. We had not even got started yet. They told Dr. Sumrall, Sumrall, you're 50 and you're finished. Well, I'll tell you, in a couple of months, I'll be 55. And I hadn't even begun yet. <laughs> Amen? Amen? This is all just warm up. You watch what God's going to do. Because I refuse to just get on cruise control. And just cruise through life. I refuse. I want to stretch. That's why I hang out with people like David Hogan. He stretches me. He makes me want to do more for God. Amen? Amen. That's why we bring him in here. So he'll infect you and get you wanting to do more for God. And getting you to get bold and step out and try things and do things. And, and things that people tell you you can't do. And I'm telling you, God through you can do them. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's all stand up. Did y'all get anything out of this this morning? Yes. Well, I'm going to pray right now. Agree with me, those watching by internet right now in the name of Jesus. Your needs are met by Jesus Christ, by his spirit. You are healed. You are whole. You are made free. Just matter of fact, if you're not born again, just receive him. And everything he's got moves into you with him. He brings all his stuff with him. He brings healing. He brings deliverance. He brings freedom. He brings joy, peace, long-suffering. All these things he brings with him. Just receive him. The minute you get born again... You get healed. As far as God is concerned, it's done. So we just right now set you free in Jesus' name. Amen? Be healed in Jesus' name. Those of you that are here present, in the name of Jesus right now, I set you free. He did it 2,000 years ago. He paid for it. I'm just announcing the decree from the king that he has set you free, that he has destroyed the works of the devil, and that right now we enforce that victory over his enemy. Sickness and disease, demonic influence, addictions, habits, all of these things. Just confusion in the mind and torment. I command in the name of Jesus, go! Set these people free in Jesus' name. You have no place here. In the name of Jesus. So be it. So be it. Even now, just begin to move and do what you couldn't, whatever it is you couldn't do before. Just begin to do it. And just give him glory for it. Just begin to thank him for it. But I say in Jesus' name, Jesus Christ makes you whole. Jesus Christ sets you free. So be it. Amen? Amen. 
All right. Well, God bless you. We're going to dismiss you now. Uh, might as well hang out in fellowship a bit and go to the senior care because the, uh, all the restaurants are already full. <laughs> I trust this message from the Word of God has been a blessing to you. If you need further assistance, do not hesitate to contact us at www.jglm.org or you can write to us at P.O. Box 742-947, Dallas, Texas, 75374. If you need prayer or would like to request a prayer cloth, feel free to contact us. Now, right now, I'm going to pray. God is going to set you free right where you are. God is not bound by time or distance. So in the name of Jesus, right now, I set you free. In Jesus' name, be healed, be made whole, be free in Jesus' name. So be it. Amen. God bless you.